Environmental harm and pollution and the Environmental Protection Act are really important concepts within the Queensland Environmental Regulatory System. So in this lecture, we're going to look at them and unpack them. So within the last few lectures on mining and coal seam gas, we've been looking and I've been mentioning the Environmental Protection Act in the context of those topic areas. Today's lecture focuses on environmental harm and pollution, but it's really all about the Environmental Protection Act. So the core concepts, the core offences in the Environmental Protection Act are built around the concept of environmental harm. And there's a whole range of important tools within this act. And I want to try and unpack some of the major ones for you and, and help you understand this important piece of legislation. But in as I said, previous lectures, we've looked at mining and coal seam gas as their own topics within which the Environmental Protection Act is an also a critical component. So in today's lecture, I could have structured it like this because I've been structuring previous lectures around problems and then asking, well, does the activity comply with the law? And if not, what steps need to be taken to make it comply? And there's really three problems that I'm going to look at. Uh, a, a small pollution incident in Townsville, uh, a landfill and link energy. But I think it's easier and better to think of this lecture in a different conceptual way. I'm going to really approach it in two parts. Part one, I really want to focus on the key definitions and concepts in the Environmental Protection Act. And I'm going to use the problem of a bitumen primer spill in Townsville which I was involved in when I worked for the Department of Environment back a couple of decades ago. And I've got a series of photographs for you that really, I think, make an interesting problem and a good way to tease out core concepts in the Act, the major offence provisions, the general environmental duty and enforcement options as well. So that's going to be a big component of the lecture. Then I want to just move in part two to looking at the approval processes and other tools under the Environmental Protection Act. Now I want to focus on several tools. So just to explain, the first part, the key concepts and environmental harm, generally those offences and concepts only occur when you don't have an approval. So they're really important uh, general offences, but once you get into the Act, you find that there's a range of activities that can be authorised called environmentally relevant activities and they can be authorised under the Planning Act and the Development Assessment System or they can be authorised for mining and, and petroleum activities as well. So that those environmentally relevant activities uh, obtain an environmental authority for mining and petroleum. They, they are linked into development approvals under the planning system and then the conditions of those approvals become the critical for enforcement and it tends to be then breaches of those conditions that lead to prosecutions but the general offence provisions uh, occur when something isn't hasn't been authorized or isn't you know doesn't have conditions linked to it so they're all inter interrelated but I want to use the uh, general provisions uh, to start with to sort of set the scene and then go on and look at the approval processes and particularly look at a landfill and a big prosecution of a company called Link Energy. And I particularly want to unpack a few of the mechanisms in the Act, contaminated land, executive office of liability, due diligence, and mention also recent reforms called chain of responsibility laws and why those are significant. So the Environmental Protection Act, uh, yeah, you, could, you can think of it as uh, a series of key definitions and then a series of environmental planning and management tools. Uh, I just mentioned too that ship source pollution is generally not covered under the Environmental Protection Act. There's, there are separate legislate, there is separate legislation for uh, ships. So if a ship is in uh, port and it releases oil, it will be prosecuted under the uh, Transport Operations in Brackets Marine Pollution Act, uh, Queensland legislation. Uh, 
Similarly, if a ship is out, say in the Great Barrier Reef, it can be prosecuted under other legislation. There have been some prosecutions under the Environmental Protection Act when those other pieces of legislation didn't have sufficient uh, penalty provisions to properly punish um, big pollution events. But generally ship source pollution, so if pollution oil or something comes from a ship, it's generally not enforced under the Environmental Protection Act. It, it can be if they're within Queensland waters, but generally not. When we're thinking about the Environmental Protection Act, it's generally land sourced pollution. I just mentioned though, before I jump into the Environmental Protection Act, a preliminary topic, which is uh, a story about dioxin contamination of Sydney Harbour. And I want to mention this because and a couple of other examples and stories to show the importance of pollution controls generally. So this was the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald a few years ago. I was traveling through Sydney and I just happened to see the paper on the day and it had this amazing story in it, the poison that got away. Harbour dioxin, dioxins hit critical levels. And the story says the fishing bans in Sydney Harbour will have to stay in place for decades due to high levels of high levels of dioxins, despite an expensive cleanup of Homebush Bay, the original source of the contamination. And I became fascinated with this because I'd never heard of it. I thought Sydney Harbour, you look at it, it looks beautiful and, you know, ships sailing on it, the water looks clean. And I didn't realize that there was this heavy contamination. And so I looked into it and this was an, a, an internal page within that story. It talked, basically it gave the history of the toxic residue and talked about how in the 1950s a company called Union Carbide which became infamous in the 1980s for a big uh, gas disaster in Bhopal in India where thousands and thousands of people were killed uh, after there was a release and at night time and a lot of people died in their sleep and Union Carbide was a big international company and it had a factory in the upper reaches of Sydney and it had been producing a range of uh, chemicals including dioxins uh, that contaminated uh, Sydney Harbour and it wasn't discovered until so this was through the 50s and 60s uh, ironically it was in sad irony a lot of the some of the chemicals that caused the contamination of Sydney Harbour were the chemicals that were used for Agent Orange that was used in the Vietnam War and caused terrible harm in Vietnam. So it was a defoliant uh, and uh, yeah, the pollution also impacted in Sydney. Anyway, this, the site was closed down in the 80s and then there was a big cleanup uh, effort to fix it. So just to give you context, you got Sydney Harbour there and you can see the Sydney CBD and Harbour Bridge shown uh, in the middle. And then Homebush Bay is a pollution site about 12 kilometers up from, so here's the CBD where everyone's been, you know, the Sydney Circular Quay, the ships coming in and the like, uh, and Sydney Harbour Bridge. So upstream, about 12 kilometers up the river, uh, is Homebush Bay. So if I focus in on that, you can see the CBD here in the distance. And here's the site as it's been, it's been cleared, and this is in 2005, and, and urban development was being built on it. So this was the site in 1928. So if I just go back, so you can see this bridge here, and it's got this sort of, sort of peninsula sort of um, look, and there's two bridges going across. So here is one of those bridges going across. So this is where that, um, if I go back, this, urban development site here. This is where it would be on that um, back in 1928. So here's a few different images of it from 1930s through to 1970. So this was from a big report into the remediation of this site. It was called different things, but basically you can see here the site uh, that became contaminated. And you can see in the 1950s, there's all this reclamation work going on. And then by the 1970s, it had this quite artificial uh, sort of coastline and um, yeah, had been uh, infilled. There was a lot of industrial um, development there. 
This was an image from the 1934 uh, Trebel Chemical Company. So there was a whole range of things that were being manufactured there, paints and yeah. This is the Union Carbide Chemical um, Factory in the 1960s. So this is when a lot of the contamination occurred. And here's some of the chemicals that were produced at the site. So from 1928, timber preservatives, and then through the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, and particularly through the 1950 and onwards, there's the different um, uh, dioxins that were produced uh, that basically what, what happened was the, the manufacturer of them um, produced a toxic um, residue when they, were, when they were produced and it basically just was all distributed around the site and uh, there was very poor site management in terms of stormwater management so when it rained a lot of the pollutants would just flow off into the surrounding area so when it was remediated in the 1990s, they basically dug up a lot of the um, soil and took it away. But the problem was that a lot of the contaminants had already moved into the water and then spread through Sydney Harbour. So this is the, an image of Sydney Harbour. Here's the Harbour Bridge right down here. And then it's very light, but this is also the harbour um, south or downstream of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So the darker blue is all upstream. And what this uh, map shows is the concentrations of um, the um, toxins that had come from the site are shown in, uh, I think it's parts per trillion um, in the World Health Organization toxic, toxic equivalency factors. And yeah, I actually don't think it's parts per trillion. Anyway, toxic equivalency factors. And basically, the higher the number, the worse it is. So around the site, so here's the site at Rhodes, and you've got levels of 610. And then as it gets further away, down around um, Sydney Harbour Bridge, it's like down in 56. But even downstream of the Harbour Bridge, you've got levels like 88. And all the way around in Sydney Harbour, there's different pollution levels and basically the chemical fingerprint from the pollutants that were produced at Rhodes were used to link all of the pollution through Sydney Harbour a lot of it to the chemicals produced at that site so there's a better um, version of that image so you can see there the 610 and here's the Sydney Harbour Bridge and then going down. So basically pollutants spread from this site throughout the harbour and it spread across the sediment on the harbour floor and is basically impractical. You can't go around and hoover it back up. It's very long lived and it also bioaccumulates. So little algae and the like, you know, pick it up and then they're eaten by little worms or you know, little things crawling around in the bottom that are then eaten by crabs, that are then eaten by fish, that are then eaten by humans. So that's, if you have something that is picked up and goes through the food chain, you can have very low levels that then become quite high in the top order predators. So in Sydney Harbour, there is, uh, there's a ban on commercial fishing north of the Harbour Bridge. And there's also a recommendation that you don't eat any fish or any seafood that's caught north of the Harbour Bridge at all. And then beneath the Harbour Bridge, the, you're meant to basically uh, stick to monthly limits of them because of the bioaccumulation. So yeah, the source of pollution. Uh, and what I wanna emphasize with this, so a lot of basically people ignore these warnings. There's warning signs up if you go down to Sydney, it says don't, yeah, basically don't eat fish. So this is an actual warning sign in multilingual placed around Sydney Harbour due to elevated levels of dioxins, fish and other crustaceans uh, caught west of the Sydney Harbour Bridge should not be eaten. You should release your catch, but you'll see a lot of people fishing there. The thing I wanted to, to take away from that is that environmental regulation is hard. Managing and regulating sites such as the former Union Carbide factory is difficult, complex, technical and may involve activities spanning decades that cause severe cumulative impacts with long-term effects. It's, this is really hard stuff. Like the chemistry is really hard. The 
the management, the record keeping, the, you know, things can be going on and you don't even realize they're causing harm. And yeah, it builds up and it's long term, it spans, you know, huge, it has huge implications. Anyway, I wrote an article about this called Sydney Harbour's Toxic Legacy Shows Value of Green Safety Net back in 2012. And uh, I've given you the link there if you want to go and read about that. But essentially, I was making the argument because at that time there was a real push to get rid of environmental regulation to, it was called green tape. We wanted to get rid of a whole heap of things that were said to be holding business back. And I tried to come up with a metaphor to replace green green tape by calling it the green safety net. And you can think of environmental law, environmental regulation, like a green safety net. It's there to protect the community. And it is often really complex and really technical. But that's because the problems that it's dealing with are really complex and technical. And as this example from Sydney shows, often they can span really long time frames, involve really complex chemistry, and it's very difficult to administer. And you should bear in mind as well that the regulators that are managing these sites, it's not just the only site they have to deal with. Like the Sydney regulators, sorry, the environmental regulators that would have managed that site would have been covering the whole of New South Wales. So you've got that have hundreds or thousands of other sites. This is just one of the sites that they're managing. And it also goes on for decades. So you've got to have the record keeping. Uh, everything that goes into managing a complex site becomes so much harder when you're dealing with hundreds of them. So, yeah, it's hard. Okay, a couple of other uh, just examples. So there's many famous or infamous cases of mass pollution overseas. And I just wanted to mention massive fines. So this is the, um, the big um, oil disaster in the U.S., a decade ago where that big oil rig caught fire, the Deepwater Horizon caught fire and burnt to the um, waterline and then a massive amount of oil was discharged into the Gulf of Mexico. I just mentioned that the billions and billions of dollars in fines that was imposed upon B BP for that. So they had a $7.2 billion uh, civil settlement and they also had a $4.5 billion criminal uh, settlement as well as your own cleanup costs and all the others. So you're looking at, you know, well over $10 billion that it cost BP. There's also a whole range of complex uh, pollution problems around the world. Air pollution is obviously a massive health threat in many parts of the world. China and India uh, stand out, but many other, many other countries as well. So here's an image of people wearing masks for air pollution uh, back in uh, 2014 and obviously now everyone will be wearing them for coronavirus but uh, yeah air pollution massive issue in many parts of the world so pollution takes many forms and climate change and ocean acidification is another uh, form of pollution and its impact so when i last gave this lecture back in 2016 i had this slide in it and it was saying that at the time there was uh, a massive coral bleaching event going on uh, where 93% of the reefs ac across the Great Barrier Reef had been hit by coral bleaching. And sadly, that's also what's recently happened. So if we update now to 2020, uh, we are yet to see the results are yet to be finalized on the extent of coral bleaching. We'll know that in coming weeks, but there's been another massive coral bleaching event across the Great Barrier Reef. So that's effectively a pollution event, uh, which, or, you know, it's pollution from carbon dioxide and other uh, greenhouse gases that are causing impacts through climate change. So pollution has many different forms and many different impacts. So in that background, that context, I want to look at the Environmental Protection Act and focus on how we deal with pollution in Queensland I'm going to, you're going to, we're going to see that we don't really use the term pollution we've got a term called environmental harm and then there's a range of concepts related to it and the uh, offenses under it and I want to unpack those 
through a problem of a relatively small pollution event in back in 1999 when I was working for the Department of Environment up in Townsville and um, the story starts with yeah I'll use it to unpack the core concepts of the act and then we'll go on and look at licensing uh, in the second part of the lecture so our problem today is a bitumen primer spill it occurred in 1999 we'll look at the key definitions and concepts in the act so Townsville as you know is uh, in North Queensland so when I finished uh, university and finished science and law at UQ I got a job working for the Department of Environment up in Townsville so I went up there and this was um, uh, part of well, one of the activities that I dealt with while I was there for a couple of years so the incident occurred in Annandale so I'm going to focus in on this so um, Townsville a lovely city it's got magnetic island off uh, the coast so tourism it's got a big army base um, as well army training areas so it's also got a big port and um, some big refineries so there's the Yubulu nickel refinery that I'll mention at the end of the lecture in relation to chain of responsibility laws there's another big um, refineries to the um, south of Townsville and yeah some wonderful environmental you know wonderful conservation areas around Townsville as well as being adjacent to the Great Barrier Reef so it's an incredible city in many ways so focusing in on Annandale so you can see here the um, port of Townsville uh, where a lot of coal goes out but also uh, actually it's not so much coal it's more the stuff uh, more other minerals going out I think than than more than coal um, I'm sure there's some coal that goes out through it but yeah big port a uh, range of things going out from port of Townsville uh, in the center of Townsville there's Castle Hill and then the Strand if you've been to Townsville a lovely um, area along the Strand and then there's a couple of rivers that run through it Ross um, River and then Ross Creek I think is this one over here anyway um, the pollution incident occurred in Annadale and I'm going to focus in on that red circle so focusing in, you can see the river here and you know that that's flowing down to the Great Barrier Reef and then there's a little tributary coming off it and I'm going to focus in on obviously the red circle and the incident occurred before the houses were there or when the houses were being built. So I'm going to show you a couple of photographs. One taken or a couple taken at this point A and some taken this point B and then looking along this drain here running into the creek so focusing in on this little creek system here so this is if you went to um, the site now this is what it looks like and this is what it looked like back in 99 when I went there so the story was I got into work on a Monday and was told about a pollution incident that had occurred uh, on the weekend and got in the car and went out with some other officers to the site and this was basically what we saw so these are some of the pictures taken when we arrived on site the incident had occurred on I think the Saturday and the story was that the construction company that was building the housing estate so the houses that are there now were being constructed in 1999 or the, the housing estate was being constructed and the construction company was um, building the roads before the houses um, and the subdivision would go in so it was in um, I think it was in December of 1999 so uh, in the wet season and the um, company um, had been falling behind um, its schedule and a, a that they on this particular day they had to lay the bitumen for this road that you can see here so I'll just go back for just to give you a bit of context as well see this little drain here so if I go back that's that drain now so this is what you see now you see a whole street of houses this is it back in 1999 so the uh, company that was constructing had its workmen there they had all these machine this machinery steamrollers and you know loaders and the like and another company was delivering the bitumen 
so a big um, road making company so uh, it was a contractor and the company that was constructing the road um, had all the machinery there and the the truck showed up to deliver before you lay um, bitumen I didn't know this but you, before you lay bitumen so you know bitumen is that sticky tarry stuff before you lay it you yeah. put down what's called bitumen primer and as I understand it it's a 50 50 mix between bitumen and diesel and it's meant to make the bitumen a little bit um, less viscous so that it can soak into the soil so that then you spray it on the soil and then the the tar when you lay the bitumen sticks better so the bitumen primer truck arrived to spray before the bitumen would come and the truck driver said to the foreman that he was a bit worried about the storm clouds storm clouds that were around because there was it was the wet season there were heavy um, storm clouds around and he was a bit worried that you know it was going to rain and the foreman said no we are behind schedule uh, we've got to we've got to lay um, go ahead and spray so they started spraying the bitumen primer and they'd been going for a little while when the heavens open and it just started pouring with rain and if you've been in a tropical uh, downpour you know that it's just can be massive amounts of water coming down so they shut off um, the bitumen primer um, and basically the foreman said, well, we're not doing, we can't do any more work today. Uh, it's too wet. Um, basically everyone closed up the machinery and left the site. The problem was that the bitumen primer also um, left the site because what happened was it lifted off in the heavy rain and it ran down the drain and just around the corner, you can see here, um, some of the residues. So this is the Monday. It happened on the Saturday and uh, one of our inspectors, um, that's his hat, um, sitting there in the drain. But you can see the oily residue. <coughs> and it ran down and into this culvert, into the stormwater drain, went into that, and then down the drain, the stormwater drain. Um, you can see here the residue um, from where it had, so it obviously was just flowing really uh, at a huge volume. You can see the residue that's left. Um, ironically, they've got um, sediment fencing up, which is good for complying with um, the general environmental duty, but which is a, co a concept under the Environmental Protection Act of taking reasonable care. But obviously, it did nothing for the um, yeah for the bitumen primer. So it all flowed down this drain, and then came down to the end of the stormwater drain and flowed into where they'd constructed this big um, stormwater retention device to slow the water down before it entered the creek. And um, this is the um, stormwater retention device that had been constructed. And you can see there the oily residue still lying around and these white pads um, that they were using then to soak up the, um, yeah, the oil. So what had happened when on Saturday was they left the site and it was pouring with rain, but one of the neighbors saw pollution going into the creek and saw this oil and rang up um, our the department's um, pollution hotline and our inspector was notified and he went out to the site and saw the pollution happening and was able to contact the company from the contact details on their machinery, called them up and, and told them what was happening. They sent their workers back and they then went, they didn't have any cleanup equipment themselves, but they went to the port of Townsville, which was just down the road, and which had a whole heap of um, pollution control equipment um, for oil spills. And so they're able to get a whole heap of um, absorbent pads and the like. So here you can see the oil. Um, this is again the Monday, the incident occurred a couple of days before. This is just what's left. So the company, uh, when they were told about the pollution occurring, they responded really well. There was about 30 um, employees for the company. They got all their workers back and they got into cleaning up. They got the equipment from the port of Townsville and you can see here an absorbent boom. They're trying to soak up as much oil as possible. And um, the creek itself isn't pristine. Like this was just downstream. There was like a, 
a road going across it. You can see the rubbish in it, but there's also oil all along the banks now. And here's the workers um, cleaning up. Now, what I, you can see they're absorbing booms. Now, one thing I really want you to notice here is um, the high uh, levels of workplace health and safety. You can see um, all the workers have got on their um, protective boots um, and they're covered in total overalls and protective gloves uh, and goggles and all of the yeah all of the safety equipment yeah I'm joking um, the point here is there's nothing they, they these guys are walking around in this creek with broken glass and whatever no protective equipment on um, and yeah uh, you might sort of shake your head and go wow this is really bad workplace health and safety and it is but it also reflected the level of the company um, yeah so often when you're a regulator you deal with you know some big companies like bhp or you know exxon Mobil, and they you know they've got thousands of staff they've got all their procedures in place they've got a whole range of you know their, their employees are drummed into them about workplace health and safety and then you go down to small and medium companies and it's a very different story so um, the poor protective equipment here that the staff have also reflected really their environmental procedures they pretty well just didn't have them they um, well should say they didn't have them you could see they had some sediment fencing up there but it was pretty minimal so what offense if any has the company committed if if that occurred now and how can a regulator respond in a situation like this that's the problem I want to deal with now so what offense if any has the company committed so the major offenses for uh, pollution in Queensland are dealt with under the Environmental Protection Act so I want to try and unpack that so this act has been around since 1994 so when I dealt with it in 98 99 when I was working for the department it was actually quite a small act it was only about 100 pages long it was quite small and quite simple and it's been through numerous major reforms is a good euphemism for it um, to its structure since 1994 a lot of those reforms have have made it much more complicated and the structure that used to be there that was quite logical has been really destroyed so now when you look at this act it is really complicated and really difficult to understand and doesn't really have a logical structure so some of the major reforms that have really destroyed its original logic was in 1997 it was integrated into the planning regime it used to be its own separate licensing regime and it was integrated into the what now is the development assessment process under the planning act back in 1997 that was the original form of that was created in the integrated planning act the Environmental Protection Act was one of the first acts that was integrated into the process created with the new planning laws in 1997 and that really destroyed the logic of the act it sort of yeah cleaved it like a stake through the heart uh, then in um, 2000 there were also more major reforms for mining uh, where they tried to beef up the um, regulation of mining uh, and give all of the regulation of mining to the Department of Environment and pull that away from the Department of Mines uh, and then there have been since then there have been a whole series of major reforms and, and in 2013 there was the thing called the green tape reforms so and just recently we've had um, chain of responsibility laws and just last year were major reforms for mine rehabilitation so a whole series of major reforms if we just look at it now the act is pretty enormous it's 755 pages there's also four bits of subordinate legislation the environmental protection regulation 2019 which is 330 pages uh, and then three what are called EPPs environmental protection policies one for air one for noise and one for water and wetland biodiversity uh, all were redone in 2019 so three EPPs one environmental protection regulation the EPPs are quite short uh, 
the regulation much longer. So that's the Act. We could go to the state government website and download it. Uh, we've done that in previous lectures. I don't want to repeat that in this lecture. I really want to try and it's, it's a very complicated piece of legislation now. And I want to just uh, tell you a little bit about the history so that you can understand where we are now and why it is so illogical in ways. And that's got some useful lessons for other, you know, when you're just dealing with laws generally. So this is the old structure of the Environmental Protection Act prior to the 2013 Green Tape Reduction um, Amendments. So the Act, when I had dealt with it 20 years ago, had a different structure. But let's just start with 2013, skip over the earlier versions. In 2013, there were a series of chapters, chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 4A, 5, 5A, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. What there used to be was a separation for environmental authorities particularly. Um, chapter 4 dealt with development approvals, and then Chapter 5 and 5A dealt with environmental authorities for mining activities and petroleum activities. And what happened with the green tape reduction reforms in 2013 was that, I'll just go back, Chapters 4 and 5A were integrated into a single Chapter 5. Um, so that now there's a single chapter five that deals with environmental authorities and that deals both with um, assessment of environmentally rel relevant activities under the planning framework as well as assessment of uh, mining and petroleum activities. But when they renumbered or when they got rid of those, they didn't get rid of or they didn't take the opportunity to change the uh, chapter numbers. It's pretty silly, really. So now you've got chapters one, two, and three. Then there's a chapter four, capital A, and then chapter five, and then chapter five, capital A, and no chapter six. So I mean, they could have just renumbered um, those as four and six, but they didn't. So you've got this illogical sort of chapter structure and a whole heap of tools. So now, uh, chapter 5 has been uh, renamed um, and includes what are called um, Progressive Rehabilitation and Closure Plans, so PRCs. Uh, and uh, that's been a major reform in 2018-2019 to better deal with uh, mine rehabilitation. So that's in Chapter 5. So that's our overall structure. So if we downloaded the Act, remember our basic steps for... Um, statutory interpretation, identify the laws in force at the time relevant to your problem. So we've identified them, we've got the Act, we've got the regulations, we've got the EPPs, uh, and then we, so we downloaded them, we skim read them, so we skim read them and this is what we find in terms of the structure of the Act. And we could look through it and we find that there's some environmental offences uh, in um, Chapter 8 that deal with things like water pollution as well as environmental harm. I just mentioned uh, the mine rehabilitation reforms in 2018 and 2019. So these have now created requirements for progressive rehabilitation and closure of mine land. And yeah, they're major reforms to deal with a big problem that we've got, which is yeah, lack of, um, well, there's been big problems with mine rehabilitation in the past. But for our problem, that's I'll, I'll park that until we go on to part two of um, the lecture. So for our problem, we've got this pollution incident. So how is it regulated? So if we look at the Act, and I want to drill into what we can, how we can conceptualise it for this problem. Um, I've uploaded a handout to the Blackboard site that you can go and um, download, but. I'd suggest you can think of the complex structure in this act or the complex concepts um, in this way. It's got an overall objective of protecting the environment while allowing for ecologically sustainable development in section three. So it's about protecting the environment while allowing for yeah, ecologically sustainable de development. It's got a series of key definitions early on and I want to unpack them um, in a moment. On the second page of the handout I've summarized or I've set out key provisions of those. So 
I'd like you to be aware of those key um, concepts. So particularly the concept around environmental harm and the general environmental duty. Um, and mentioning the general environmental duty, the really the core concept in the act is this one. It's a relationship between what's called the general environmental duty, the set, set out in section 319, and it basically says a person must not carry out any activity that causes or is likely to cause environmental harm unless the person takes all reasonable and practicable measures to prevent or minimize the harm. So that concept comes from um, reasonable care in negligence law. So you're all familiar with if you're driving a car, you've got a duty to take reasonable care not to harm other people. So that so if you're driving along and you know you're talking on your phone, um, not watching where you're going, you're going too fast, and you run into someone and they're injured and you damage their car, well, you'll be liable uh, for the damage that you've caused because you haven't, what the law says is you haven't taken reasonable care. You had a duty when you're operating the car to take reasonable care to avoid damage to other people and their property. So because you were talking on your phone, so you weren't paying proper attention, you're going too fast, there's two things that you were doing that weren't reasonable care or not complying with the duty of reasonable care. So the Environmental Protection Act took the concept of reasonable care and applied it to the environment. So people now in Queensland and in many other places, because the general environmental duty has been quite widely adopted in other, other states and other jurisdictions. So the general environmental duty um, imposes that similar sort of um, broad duty uh, to take reasonable care. And that, that the, the value in the concept of reasonable care is, is it, it's very flexible to deal with whatever situation, the complex facts of, you know, that reality throws up. Reasonable care gives you an objective standard that can be applied in many, many, many different situations. So what's reasonable depends on a range of things, including the risk as well as the costs of taking particular measures. So the general environmental duty is there and there's also linked to that a um, basically a concept about causing unlawful environmental harm and that um, is set out in section 493 of the Act. And then there's a whole series of planning and management tools that are created in the Act that really hang off these core concepts and core definitions. And I've set those out on the handout. I, I realized when I was um, revising the um, notes for this lecture, the changes that have occurred to the Act recently really make the list of tools, it's really difficult to actually specify um, a single list of planning and management tools because under the Act, We've got uh, things like environmental protection policies. So there's three of those, as I mentioned before. That was an idea back in the 90s. It was an idea that they were meant to, it, we'd create this act which created a framework and then we would flesh them out with detail about EPPs, identifying the environmental values that the community wanted to protect. Anyway, they never really, it was this good idea that never really blossomed. Um, we've got three, PP, three EPPs, uh, but they're not really a major, they're important, but they're not, uh, the original idea was for them to be much um, more comprehensive and detailed. They only deal with air, um, water, uh, and biodiversity and, and noise. Anyway, I'll leave aside the EPPs. There's an environmental impact statement process uh, in the Act um, in an early chapter, um, and then there's environmental relevant activities in chapter five. Within environmental relevant activities, there's a whole range of um, sort of tools that are built into them, including the requirements for progressive rehabilitation and closure plans and schedules for mining activities and coal seam gas activities in particular. They're all now linked to the environmental authorities. Um, and there's also linked to that requirements for financial assurances. So requirements to have money set aside to pay for the rehabilitation if the company goes you know, belly up. 
and can't pay for the rehabilitation itself. So those are all linked in now to the environmental authorities. Apart from those tools, there's a range of other things that the Act has. It's got environmental evaluations and audits can be ordered. Um, orders can be made for cleanup as well as what are called environmental protection orders. And as part of those environmental protection orders, we've now got um, chain of responsibility laws that I'll mention in the second part of the lecture as well. Um, there's a system for contaminated land management. Uh, again, I mentioned that in the second part. But for our purposes right now, it's the environmental offences that are most significant. There's some offences uh, in the Act for um, releasing a prescribed contaminant. Um, so around section 440ZD, so releasing uh, something like this oil to a waterway or a stormwater can be dealt with under um, those offence provisions. Back when I dealt with it, it, it was dealt with under the general offence provisions for causing serious and material environmental harm uh, and issuing pins as well. So I want to really focus on those. So um, the environmental offences um, we'll look at. So I want to just look at the Act, but I noticed that we've been going for about 50 minutes. Do you guys want to take a break? So welcome back to the second half of our lecture. Uh, can you guys still see the screen there? So do you see now the handout? Simplified structure of the Environmental Protection Act? Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, available on the Blackboard site and there's a whole range of environmental management tools and I'm just going to want to pull out a few of them, but particularly focusing on the environmental offences. So you can think of this Act as, yes, it's got its objective of environmental protection, but it's really a, a big toolbox that regulators can use to protect the environment. Is it all these different mechanisms in it? So there's the licensing and approval system linked to environmentally relevant activities, but there's a whole range of other things, investigative powers, um, contaminated land provisions, a whole range of tools. I think that that's the best metaphor to think of this act as. And for our, the purposes of our course, I only really want to focus on a few of the tools. If you end up working for the Department of Environment, you'll become familiar with you know, the whole complex act. Or if you're dealing in industry and you're having to deal with the regulator in, in detail, then yes, you'll become more familiar with it. But for our purposes, I really just want to focus on the core concepts and a few of the uh, significant um, systems like contaminated land. So if I go across to the Act itself, do you guys now have um, the Environmental Protection Act on your screens? Yep. So the actual act, and I've made it a little bit bigger there. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So there's general offences. So if we took our approach of of um, of you know downloading the legislation. So our problem is, remember, we've got this pollution incident in Townsville. This company was um, laying bitumen primer, and the they started laying and then the rain came and it all washed into the stormwater system and flowed into a creek. And then they did um, some cleanup to try and get rid of it, to try and pick it up. But of a lot of it flowed away and that ultimately would have flowed down to the Port of Townsville and the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. So what offence might they have committed? You know, if we asked how the question um, that I've asked in a lot of other lectures, you know, does the activity comply with the law? And if not, what needs to be done to make it comply. Uh, well, the general um, requirements in the Act um, around environmental harm is... They'd already you know, started. Sorry, say that again. Sorry. Okay, did a little bit of crosstalk there. So uh, we'd look for this Act in terms of what offence might they have committed and we find that in Chapter 8, there's a whole range of offences for um, environmental offences related to carrying out an environmental relevant activity without holding an environmental authority. Well, that's an offence. And then there's a range of other offences. But the ones that I wanted to focus on were there's complying with conditions, com complying with a whole range of different things in the Act. Um, but the the... Offences I want to focus on are 
437 uh, and 438. So a person must not willfully and unlawfully cause serious environmental harm. So if I highlight that, and the maximum penalty is 6,250 penalty units or five years imprisonment. And 438, a person must not willfully and unlawfully cause material environmental harm. Now, I just mentioned before I leave this, I want to focus on those offences, but now if we were actually um, looking, well, we've got these offences for serious and environmental, uh, serious and material environmental harm. So let's just write those down. So we've got 437 and 438. Um, and there's another offence um, that I just wanted to draw to your attention, which is section 440. Offences relating to water contamination. We'll look at this in one of the tutes uh, about statutory interpretation, but there's now um, offences for releasing prescribed water contaminants. And, and so this also creates um, related offences. It doesn't use the concept of environmental harm di di um, directly, but um, says here in 440ZG, a person must not unlawfully deposit a prescribed water contaminant in waters or in a roadside gutter or stormwater um, drain or in another place where the contaminant could reasonably be expected to wash, blow, fall or otherwise move into a roadside gutter or stormwater drain. So that might also be, um, well, it'd certainly be something to consider in terms of the potential offences. So have they committed an offence against 440ZG? But a key provision with all of these is unlawfully. So a person must not unlawfully deposit a prescribed water contaminant. And similarly, um, in 443.7, you see a person must not unlawfully, sorry, willfully and unlawfully cause serious environmental harm. And similarly for um, 438. So if we look at this with our lawyer's hats on, you look at the elements of the offence, it has to be a person, so uh, a person includes a company, um, we, you get that sort of definition from the Acts Interpretation Act, so the company here, um, have they committed, or have they willfully and unlawfully caused serious environmental harm, or material environmental harm, or released a prescribed water contaminant, so what does unlawfully mean and what does material and serious environmental harm mean as well and prescribed water contaminant. So we'd have to go and look up all of those things. So, you know, we do our cross-referencing. So to get the early, the key definitions um, of serious and material environmental harm, you have to build up a series of concepts that are dealt with right at the front of the Act. So this Act both has a list of things in the dictionary. So in section seven, it links to the dictionary in schedule four, but it also then has some key concepts set out at the front. So environment is defined very widely as including ecosystems and their constituent parts, including people and communities, all natural and physical resources and the qualities and characteristics of those things. So basically, yeah, it's very wide, includes the physical and biotic environments. So not just, you know, the physical, like the soil without any living things in it. It also includes um, the living environment. Then what this act does is build up the concept of environmental harm through um, a, a particularly important concept is the concept of environmental value. So an environmental value is a quality or physical characteristic of the environment that is conducive to ecological health or public amenity or safety or another quality of the environment identified and declared to be an environmental value under an EPP or regulation. So for that second part, we could go across to the um, water EPP and we'd find that there is some environmental values that are identified in the water EPP. So some basic concepts for environmental values for water, 
make that a bit bigger for you. So environmental values for waters. Um, there's a list of things for specific um, waters, um, but then the general ones are for high ecological value waters, the biological integrity of an aquatic ecosystem that is effectively unmodified or highly valued, for slightly disturbed waters, for moderately disturbed waters, for highly disturbed waters, and for aquatic waters intended for human consumption. So there's a range of different um, waters that are prescribed here. So thinking in this case, you saw those pictures of the creek that this flowed into. What would you think that creek is? Do you think it is um, a high ecological value water or a slightly disturbed waters or moderately disturbed waters or highly disturbed waters? That creek. Maybe slightly or moderately. Yeah. Slightly or moderately, I mean, there's a fair bit of rubbish in there. Ultimately, as well, sorry, ultimately as well, the creek flows to the Great Barrier Reef. So um, there's a range of things um, that could be impacted here. So in terms of the Great Barrier Reef, the biological integrity of an aquatic ecosystem that is effectively unmodified or highly valued, um, or for highly disturbed waters, the biological integrity of an aquatic ecosystem that is um, measurably degraded and of lower ecological value than waters mentioned in paragraphs A and C, A to C. So those are environmental values defined in the EPP. Biological integrity is a core component of that. So do you think, um, well, if for that creek, you could think of fisheries values associated with it would be part of the biological integrity. Um, there'd be a range of things um, that, you know, it, in terms of its environmental values that are impacted by the oil. And so those, that's environmental values. So it's a quality or physical characteristic of the environment. So biological integrity um, of waters is an environmental value. It's ability to support life and at the ecosystem within it. So that's environmental value. Then the Act um, sets out concepts like contamination. It doesn't really define and use the term pollutant um, or pollution. It goes on to talk about you've got waste and those sorts of things, but the major offences aren't built around those concepts even though it talks about contaminant. It's built around the concept of environmental harm so, and that's actually wider than contaminant release or pollution. So environmental harm is any adverse effect. And I just mentioned these are all um, set out on your handout. Um, you'll see a, um, yeah, a, a summary of environmental harm as any adverse effect on an environmental value. So environmental harm is any adverse effect or potential adverse effect, whether temporary or permanent and of whatever magnitude, duration or frequency, on an environmental value and includes environmental nuisance. And it goes on to say it can be direct or indirect, but basically any adverse effect on an environmental value. So thinking of our problem here with that bitumen primer going into the creek, we know that the creek had environmental values, that there was some biological integrity associated with it. Um, it was a, a waterway, there would have been fisheries associated with it. It's also linked to the Great Barrier Reef. So the bitumen primer, I think there's about um, 700 or 800 litres, I think was the quantity that flowed into it. And you saw how much residue was there a couple of days later. So there was a significant, you know, it wasn't just a cup full of, of oil that went into it. It was a, a fair, fair truckload of oil went into it. Um, are you happy that environmental harm has been caused by that? There would be adverse effects. So you can think of all, you, you saw those pictures of the oil coating the sides of the creek. You, you'd know just from common experience that that would damage the fisheries values of it. Some fish would have been killed, some crustaceans would have been killed. So we've got environmental harm? Yes. Happy with, happy with that? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so first tick, we've got environmental harm has been caused. The Act, though, doesn't use environmental harm itself as um, 
an offence, it's there's no offence for causing environmental harm. It has to be serious or well, environmental nuisance is basically another form of sort of temporary environmental harm can be environmental nuisance. So if you've got someone playing, you know, loud music next year, you're trying to sleep and they're playing at three in the morning, you could call that an environmental nuisance. It's something that's there, but it can go away quite quickly. So environmental nuisance is odors, noise, dust, those sorts of things. But generally the non, um, the things that, that aren't there and don't persist. Um, then the act has, um, big definitions around material and serious environmental harm. And I just want to dwell on these for a minute. So perch on them and think about them in this context, because they're a really core component of this act and then linked to the offense provisions. So we've got a tick to environmental harm, but the offense, the major offenses in the act are for causing material or serious environmental harm. So you can think of it like a scale going up where environmental harm starts from zero and goes all the way to um, infinity might be the destruction of you know the the planet but you know let's just say it goes up a long way you can cause environmental harm from very trivial all the way through to you know major major pollution events major major damage to the environment the first um, threshold would probably be environmental nuisance it's a form of environmental harm um, but the major ones for the offences that we'd be thinking of here are material and serious environmental harm. So material environmental harm is environmental harm. So that, that concept that we've picked up from section 14 is environmental harm other than environmental nuisance that is not trivial or negligible in nature, extent or context. So that's a qualitative criterion. And then it says or, so that's disjunctive. So if you satisfy this, then it's environmental harm. Or oh, sorry, material environmental harm. So do you think here it is the harm that we have seen with the oil bitumen primer going into the creek in the context of that creek and the Great Barrier Reef? Do you think that that is not trivial or negligible in nature, extent, or context? Or do you think it's beneath that threshold? It is not trivial or negligible to nature. So you think it's above the threshold? Yep. Yes. yes. Is everyone happy that it's above the threshold? You think it's beyond trivial? Yeah. Yeah, so someone, for instance, maybe like throwing a bit of rubbish in, you know, like if you threw a, um, think of something that's trivial. If you threw, if someone was walking by that Creek and, um, they threw a paper wrapper into the Creek. So they littered, you might think that that was trivial, particularly if it's paper because it's going to break down, but it's, you know, it's damaging the biological integrity of the Creek. So you might say it's environmental harm, but it's trivial. Whereas, 700 or 800 litres of bitumen primer going into it is more than trivial. So we're above that threshold. But can you see that in qualitative, it, it sort of can become hard to tell exactly where um, you draw the line. So what the Act does is it, apart from giving qualitative criteria, it also gives quantitative criteria. First, that causes actual or potential loss or damage to property of an amount or amounts totaling more than the threshold amount, but less than the maximum amount. And that is the maximum amount is the threshold amount for serious environmental harm, which is $50,000. And the threshold amount means $5,000. So if we go back to that, so basically that causes actual or potential loss or damage to property between five and $50,000. So that's B. So do you think we have caused damage to property between five? So the, the bottom threshold is 5,000 and then the top, whole, top threshold is 50,000. Do you think that we've satisfied that criterion? Most likely. Yeah, I think it's something around there. So where do you, what do you think is the property here? 
the ecosystem. The water body. Yeah, who owns the creek? Government. Yeah, the state. Yep, and how do you value the fisheries, do you think? Don't know. The state. It's hard. The, the don't know um, answer is actually a pretty good one. It actually is hard to value the property sometimes. So you don't have to worry about it because what this, what this definition is doing is giving you alternatives. You could have satisfied the first one. We're happy that we already satisfied that. If you had a property damage, then you could use that. And then you've got a quantified amount. So if, if, um, you know, if you, if there was pollution caused to property that caused, you know, a $20,000 property loss, then you would be clearly in the realm of material environmental harm under B. But then there's another alternative, which is C that results in costs of more than the threshold amount, but less than the max. So between $5,000 and $50,000 of taking appropriate action to prevent or minimize the harm and to rehabilitate or restore the environment to its condition before the harm. So basically your cleanup costs. So that's a third alternative. Can you see how there's three different things happening there? There's A, which is the qualitative, B, which is the property damage, but property can be hard to quantify for the environment, and then there's the cleanup costs. The advantage of C is it's actually often easy to quantify that. And in this case, they had um, 30 guys out on Sunday, you know, cleaning up. There was the material they got from the port of, Bris port of Townsville that they would have had to pay for. We estimated that they spent about $30,000 in the cleanup costs, getting the machinery out, getting their workers out. So if it's $30,000, can you see that they satisfy C? Because they've spent between the two, the threshold amounts and the maximum amount in cleaning it up. Mm -hmm. yep. And the advantage of that from a regulator's perspective is it's easy to quantify. So if you can show that, you know, the machinery costs, whatever, um, were between that amount, then you don't, you're not left to the sort of, value judgments of trivial and negligible so uh, you can you can prove it in terms of proving the offense of material environmental harm once i knew that so i was the enforcement officer looking at this and what to do about it once i knew that they'd spent about thirty thousand dollars well that was in the realm of material environmental harm and so that's what we were looking at potentially prosecuting them for now i just mentioned too um these maximum amounts and minimum amounts haven't changed since the Act was created in 1994. So this is one of the reasons why generally legislatures don't put in money, you know, actual dollar amounts. They put in penalty units for prescribing offences because back in 1994, $5,000 was actually worth more in, you know, in real terms than five thousand dollars now so the the threshold has actually been coming down over time just through inflation and they haven't changed the money amount it's actually really easy to get over five thousand dollars in cleanup cost you know as soon as you've got a backhoe and a couple of workers you're going to be over five thousand dollars in a day um, easily you know you get a couple of bits of machinery involved um, just on there you know like a bobcat you can be looking at like six hundred a thousand dollars an hour um, you only have to have that for a few hours with some workers and you're over material environmental harm. So that's actually a really useful threshold as, from a regulator's perspective in terms of proving it. So that's material. And then are we happy that they've committed material environmental harm then? We've, we've got them. We're happy with A and happy with C. Everyone happy with that? Yes. Yeah. Not so yep. sure about the property damage. But it doesn't matter because they're or um, any one of those A, B, or C. If you can satisfy any one of them, you've got material environmental harm. Then in 17, serious environmental harm is environmental harm other than environmental nuisance that is irreversible of high impact or widespread. So that's the first one. Do you think 
that we are in that realm for this offense? Is it irreversible of high impact or widespread? Impact could be high, but it, uh, it seems like it could be irreversible and not too widespread at the, at the moment. It is reversible. You can clean it up and it will, there'll be bioremediation over maybe a few months. So you're happy that it doesn't, we don't meet that criterion? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is cause to an area of high conservation value or an area of special significance such as the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area? Well, this creek ultimately flows into the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area, so you could maybe go for that, but the creeks, you know, it ultimately flows out near the port of Townsville. There's quite a few kilometers for it to flow to get to the GBR. There's a fair bit of dispersal by the time it gets there. Yeah, that one's harder in this case, maybe, but, um, and then causes actual or potential loss or damage to property of more than $50,000. The threshold amount is defined as 50,000. So again, we've got the problem of proving, you know, what is the property loss that's occurred here and so c doesn't really fit and then the cleanup costs is over the threshold amount so over fifty thousand dollars in cleanup costs and here we estimate it's thirty thousand so can you see in these based on these definitions we've got probably material environmental harm is the more appropriate concept rather than serious environmental harm Are you guys happy with that yeah. Yeah. So those two concepts, material and serious, then link into um, the offence provisions. So a person must not willfully and unlawfully cause serious environmental harm in 437. We don't think it's that one because we don't think we've got serious environmental harm. And that as we saw, the serious environmental harm is defined back in section 17. So you have to follow those cross references. So we could be looking at a 438 offense because we think we've got material environmental harm. So if that's our potential offense, one thing we have to also prove in terms of the elements of the offense is that it's unlawfully. So that's where this we have to then be aware of section 493. So 493, capital A, when environmental harm or related acts are unlawful. So it basically, subsection two says, a relevant act is unlawful unless it is authorized to be done under and I'll just emphasize here a development condition of a development approval or uh, an environmental authority. So mining and petroleum under an environmental authority. Um, so if you've got a development approval and it authorizes you to clear vegetation and you know um, develop some site, you're causing environmental harm. But if it's authorized by the approval, like if you've got say a big mine and you're digging a massive big um, pit for coal, then um, the environmental authority authorizes you to do that. So it's actually legalizing the environmental harm. So if you're authorized under it, it's lawful. Um, so that's subsection two. Here, they didn't have um, an environmental authority and there was no condition of the approval for the subdivision that allowed them to release a contaminant to the creek. So even though they've got a development approval for the subdivision, it didn't authorize that form of environmental harm. It authorized like the clearing of vegetation and all of that stuff, but it didn't authorize pollution to the creek. So they don't get out under subsection two, but then subsection three gives a general defense, which is it's a defense to a charge of unlawfully doing or causing environmental harm to prove that the act was done while carrying out an activity that is lawful apart from this act and that the defendant complied with the general environmental duty. So let's just say with A, 
that what they were doing was lawful apart from this act. They were authorized to you know, build the subdivision. Um, but the key thing is they've got to do both. It's got to be lawful apart from this act and they've got to comply with the general environmental duty. And that is defined back in section 319 In this way and again I've set this out on your handout so a person must not carry out any activity that causes or is likely to cause environmental harm unless the person takes all reasonable and practicable measures to prevent or minimize the harm so that's the general environmental duty and in deciding the measures that are required to be taken under subsection 1 regard must be had to the nature of the harm or potential harm, the sensitivity of the receiving environment, the current state of technical knowledge, the likelihood of successful measures and the financial implications. So let's think about that here. So they were activity they were carrying out was the um, civil construction, the, the subdivision of the land, the building the road. And they were laying bitumen primer. What and during that activity, pollution was caused to the creek. What do you think are the reasonable and practicable things that they could have done to prevent or minimize the harm? So, any ideas? Check the weather. Say that again. I'm sorry. Uh, check the weather. Check the weather. Yep. So, we'll, I'll just make a list here. Weather. So they proceeded, like the truck driver said to them, the guy who was delivering the bitumen primer said he was worried about um, the rain, the heavy rain about. So it was in the wet season and they proceeded, despite the warning from the, from the um, delivery guy. So the weather was there. Um, they took a risk, didn't they? Um, so yeah, checking the weather not pouring when there's heavy rain about. That would be reasonable and practicable, possibly. What other things do you think they could have done? You they see it regularly. Had, Sorry? They could have had environmental protection things in, in um, place, like spill kits or something for the, for the residue. That's a, that's a great point. So often now, you, if you go on to most well-managed sites, um, like industrial sites, if you look around, if you see any stormwater drains, typically they'll have um, cleanup kits um, as well as things like sandbags around any stormwater drains. So if a spill occurs, you've got, you know, um, a sandbag, for instance, that you can just roll into the drain to block it. So those, those are really common things to see on any industrial site. So if a spill occurs, there's an immediate response. So they could have had um, a spill kit. What else could they have done? I in, think the, uh, um, the staff should have been um, better equipped with knowledge about the effect, like the environmental harm they could cause, and it shouldn't have taken the neighbour reporting it to the department for something to happen. That's really close. So what they did when the rain, like when it, so they started the pour, you might say it's touch and go whether that was reasonable or not for them to pour in the circumstances. You know, like doing something where there's a risk of harm um, doesn't necessarily mean you're breaching the general environmental duty. It's all of the circumstances. You know, you could say, well, the financial implications of not pouring would be that they're behind, you know, each day that you've got um, workers there and they delay in the delivery of the project, it costs them, let's just say it costs them $50,000 a day. So not pouring, you might say, due to the financial implications, it was still reasonable to go ahead at that point. But when it rained... They just jumped in their vehicles, closed up their machinery and left the site. So instead of doing that, what would have been an actually really cheap thing to do? Covering the road with a tarp. Covering the drain. But before you even get to that, watching what's going on. Just someone there to monitor. Someone there just actually watching. They've just poured all this bitumen primer over the ground. It's pouring with rain. They left the site. 
there's no one even there just, you know, keeping an eye on what's happening. If, if someone, so this is the basic failure, really. They had no monitoring going on. Monitoring, you know, doesn't have to be, you know, hugely scientific with probes. Simply someone there looking at what's going on. The foreman, you know, left. There's no one there. So when it all started flowing into the drains, no one was watching it. So they couldn't take any action because just they didn't know what was going on. So monitoring would have been, and what are the financial implications of monitoring in this circumstance? It's the wages it's the of one person for the day, like well, they would a couple have been hundred dollars. Anyway. They yeah. would have been paying them. The financial, the, the financial implications of monitoring is like zero. Um, I'll just go back. I want to just show you some of the slides, give you a few other ideas. Um, so here's the... So do you have the, um, that picture that I showed you before on your screens? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so here's the site where it occurred, well after the rain had occurred, but in terms of other things that they could have done, so they didn't have any spill equipment there, but and it all flowed down that drain. <laughs> what else do they have there? It's, I'll give you a hint, it's in that picture. Big yellow things. Oh, the machinery. machinery. The machinery. They've got. They could have built. They could have built a fifty-foot high dam around this site. Like they had so much. They had backhoes there. They have bobcats. They've got everything. They've got graders. They could have, you know, built a, you know, a. They could have done whatever they wanted for basically no cost, because all the machinery was already there. Or they could have just, you know, dumped a few sandbags. Uh, in the drain to stop it getting away like they had everything there so the financial implications of complying with a general environmental duty might be basically nil often the general environmental duty is it's not quite saying it's common sense but you know a well-managed activity the environment good environmental management doesn't necessarily mean a wholly back extra expense it can just be as simple as you know, watching what you're doing and doing reasonable things. I mentioned before that ironically they had these sediment fences um, along the watercourse, which is commonly done on building sites now to um, comply with the general environmental duty. So I'll just go forward um, to a couple of... So I've been through the Environmental Protection Act So compliance with the general environmental duty, it's really common now to see on building sites, um, sediment fences like this, a silt fence. Can you see in that image, the creek, stockpiled soil, and then the sediment fences? So it's really common now to see that on building sites. It's been a real shift from 20 years ago where you know we just let everything sort of flow into the creeks. Now it's um, there's a much greater emphasis on sediment fencing and the like. And that's done to comply with the general environmental duty and avoid being prosecuted. And again, here's an example of a reasonable practical measure that you commonly see around building sites, little sandbags like this. And, you know, you can just roll them across. Often they'll be stacked, um, you know, on, on a, a building site. You might have them you know, stacked here, ready to roll into the drain, or you can put them there so that they're stopping sediment um, getting into the drain. Uh, all of those things are really common to see now, and it's linked to the general environmental duty. So again, here's an, an example of silt fencing, so stabilizing, um, reducing erosion, what now is regarded as reasonable and practicable measures to prevent or minimize um, harm to the environment. Again, another example on a building site, you know, if you just look around at the next building site you go past and have a look for the sediment fencing, you'll see it all over the place. Um, so very common.
So reasonable and practical measures. Um, I really want you to be aware of that because when you leave this course and you're working in industry, uh, apart from remembering the major approvals and you know the need to comply with conditions, the concept of reasonable care and the general environmental duty is a really important principle to sort of have logged in your memory because it is a key touchstone for compliance with many, many different laws, including workplace health and safety. A key component of that is taking reasonable care in the circumstances. Uh, similarly with environment, taking reasonable care, um, duties like negligence, taking reasonable care. And what reasonable care is depends on the circumstances. So the risks and the costs of the compliance measures are weighed up to determine what is reasonable. But now in um, Queensland and many parts of Australia, these, these sorts of measures are considered yeah, required by reasonable care. Any questions on that? You, you would have seen them on lots of different work sites. Okay, so reasonable care, a really important concept in the Environmental Protection Act, buried like in 319. And you have to understand really the other concepts that we went through like environmental harm, material and serious environmental harm, the fact that it's linked to um, the offences through unlawful environmental harm. Um, but just remembering that you've got to take reasonable care when you're undertaking an activity to prevent harm to the environment, that's really the thing to take away from all of this. Because if you can remember that, you and, and you comply with that, you can, you know, you will avoid um, problems um, 99 times out of 100. If you comply with reasonable, you know, re reasonable care requirements, um, that's, you know, the big thing to do. Okay, so in this case, uh, I just want to dwell um, for a moment on what enforcement options we might do as a regulator. So remember in earlier lectures, we talked about this concept of the enforcement pyramid. You go from no enforcement action through education, through administrative enforcement actions, restraint, um, through to criminal prosecution. And that there's three big elements to where you go in that enforcement pyramid, the harm, the level of harm, the level of fault and the remediation effort. So here we can get, we can prosecute them for material environmental harm. Um, we could give them a warning. Um, we could also give them a penalty infringement notice, which, which would give them a few thousand dollar fine. What do you think we should do? So let's unpack it. What's the level of harm? It's we've decided it's material environmental harm, so it's not trivial or negligible, but it's not in the serious environmental harm category, right? What about fault? What do you think? Was it deliberate? Uh, it was not deliberate. It was your classic negligence. Negligence. Yeah, not taking care. They just, they didn't mean to do it. It's not like, um, you know, it's not like a deliberate, <laughs> In, in some of the earlier lectures, we, we looked at deliberate offences that were done for commercial gain. So yes, this was a commercial activity, but they didn't get anything out of polluting the creek. Like it wasn't that they were polluting the creek to be able to get, like in that Pelican Lynx case I talked about with the land clearing, they cleared, they started clearing the site to get rid of the trees and then they were going to get a development approval for, you know, a very, very valuable um, land development, hundreds of millions of dollars. And so they were deliberately doing it. And then they, they prevented the regulator getting onto the site and they were just flouting the law deliberately. So here, there isn't that sort of fault. It's more a negligence thing. So fault is fairly low. So harm is not trivial or negligible, but not extreme. Fault is fairly low. That was stupid or, you know, negligent. What about remediation effort? Love. Minimal. Well, they didn't have the measures there, but once they were told about it, they got in and started cleaning up and they got all their workers out. And on the Sunday, they got back to the site. They didn't muck around. They went off to the port of Townsville, even though they didn't have the equipment themselves. They went off 
got it. They got in. Like, we didn't order them to get in and clean up the site. That was all them out there on Sunday cleaning up with their guys, you know, with no boots on and whatever. Um, we think they spent about $30,000. So, and you're looking at the context where, you know, those guys, they weren't wearing boots. That was just the level that they were at. And also, you know, in Townsville back 20 years ago, that was pretty common for a small to medium-sized company. They were pretty, you know, the environmental management was pretty low. So, you you know, as a regulator, you're dealing with that community. You've got to, you know, you... you at least for me, I thought the remediation effort was pretty good for, you know, f f coming off a, the initial fault that their remediation effort was pretty good. But f for our purposes here, they've done some remediation, so it pulls it down. It's something that weighs against prosecuting them. So for a prosecution, we could prosecute them for material environmental harm, the, the fines that we could have expected probably were in the range of something like $10,000. To go to court, you've got to get lawyers, there's the time and expense and resources to do it. Um, and they would be able to say in mitigation that we spent $30,000 uh, in remediating the site. Um, we're really sorry, but you know we spent this money. That would pull the, the fine down more. So... Instead of prosecuting them here, from a regulatory perspective, what other options do you think? Should we just give them a warning? I think the education would be really important in this, um, this example. Yep, so education and warning notices. But what about any anything else? Because you can warn them, but... What about a pin, a ticket? So give them a, a ticket for a few thousand dollars, like a speeding ticket. What's the advantage of the speeding ticket, uh, the pin, for from a regulator's perspective? Um, so that's an example for other companies. Yep. But from an administration perspective, what's the big advantage? You don't have to go to court. You don't have to go to court. You can just write it and issue it. They can challenge it. But most don't because you quickly chew through several thousand dollars in lawyers' costs. So it's often cheaper just to pay it. The same with the speeding fine. You might disagree that, you know, you weren't, you know, over the speed limit. But to actually challenge the police in it, you know, you have to go to court. Often you'll just take the, you know, several hundred dollar fine or whatever um, than trying to challenge it. So similarly here... Pins have the advantage of basically just no administrative, extra administrative costs. They're unlikely to be challenged. They're a good education and warning. Well, they're going beyond a warning, aren't they? But they're a really good education because if you've actually then given them a penalty um, without a lot of extra costs. So we decided to give them a, a pin in this case. Uh, so we issued them a pin. Um, just thinking about who we could issue it to, I mentioned that there were two companies involved. There's the land developer, so we gave them a pin. What about the, the company that was delivering the bitumen primer? Do you think they're potentially liable? No, because they gave a warning. They gave a warning, but then their driver poured the, the bitumen primer. So he gave a warning... So it's like you warn yourself, um, you think, oh gosh, I shouldn't do this because it's dangerous, but then you go ahead and do it. Do you think that um, you can be liable? You could be liable, but ultimately, isn't it the foreman's um, site responsibility? You know, that's the argument that, that um, the, the company delivering the bitumen primer had, <laughs> but we gave them a ticket too. Why do you think we give them a ticket? To not listen to the foreman and take due care of the environment if they think the foreman is infringing on it. Yeah, their argument was, we're just a contractor, we delivered it, it's not our fault. But from our perspective, they delivered it, but they also their driver also left the site. So um, they 
basically were a party to the same offence. And they were a big company. Um, they actually flew up their lawyer from Brisbane who came and had an angry meeting, meeting with us and complained bitterly about being given this ticket because from their perspective, they then had to report it in their annual reports. And it was something that showed a non-compliance which for large companies, those sorts of their environmental history, um, when they bid for you know projects, um, often there'll be sections where they have to prove that you know they've got a good environmental track record. So they hate getting tickets or prosecutions, not so much for the money involved in the immediate prosecution or the ticket. It's because of the the reporting. Um, obligations and problems that it can create for them in the future. So they hated getting the ticket, but we gave it to them uh, anyway, A, because they were a party to the offence, and secondly, from an education perspective, it's actually really valuable to give a ticket to that sort of company uh, in, in an appropriate circumstance, because then, you know, they, you know, educate their own workforce, and you potentially avoid um, the same thing happening on other sites. So can you see the from a regulatory perspective the sorts of considerations that you can bring? Yeah. So, yeah, we gave them two tickets. Um, I still think that it was the right decision at the time, uh, and yeah, in terms of the you know all the tools that were available to us, and the concepts, can you see how the concepts come together, and particularly around the general environmental duty and causing environmental harm? Yeah. So the enforcement guidelines, the Department of Environment and Sciences enforcement guidelines, I've said in previous lectures, they no longer have that pyramid. They've got things around impact and culpability. For the uh, ENVM 7123 students, there'll be one of the essay questions on the exam at the end of semester will be, you'll be given a set of facts and then you'll be asked to apply the enforcement guidelines to uh, advise on what enforcement options should be uh, taken by the regulator. So basically, advise you'll be in the position of being an enforcement officer and advise your manager on what should be done given a set of facts. And I want to um, I want to do that for the exam because I think it's really good for you to get you to see how policies like this uh, are really important for implementing the law. So that'll be a question that we'll look at at the end of the semester. Cool. Okay, so that's part one, key definitions and concepts. And the main thing I really want you to take away from that is the concept of the general environmental duty and taking reasonable care. And that that's such an important uh, concept to be aware of. I want to go on now to just look at some of the other tools and just pull out some of the most significant tools. Um, in the context of uh, a landfill and a prosecution of a company called Link Energy. So I want to talk a little bit about environmentally relevant activities, uh, contaminated land, executive officer liability and due diligence, and chain of responsibility um, laws. So these are a sort of uh, some of the most significant um, tools that are in the, the toolbox of this act. So. The Rochdale landfill is located about um, 20 kilometres southeast of, or 15 kilometres southeast of UQ. I used to take a field trip out to it, but I found that it used to be later in the semester and um, most people were already busy with uh, other assignments and the like. So out of a course with 250, we get about 10 people coming along. So I wasn't planning to run it this um semester even before the coronavirus would have stopped this going anyway but uh, I've got a series of pictures that come from a previous um, field trip out there so if we go out to the landfill so I'll just go back so the Rochdale landfill about 15 kilometers south east of UQ and it's the major landfill or rubbish dump for the whole of Brisbane so uh, around Brisbane all the rubbish you know if you put rubbish in a rubbish bin um, not in a recycling bin, but in just a normal rubbish bin, it ultimately ends up at Rochdale. So here's um, the landfill, just focusing in on it. Here's a big truck delivering. Um, so when you see um, around Brisbane, um, you know, the little rubbish trucks that come around and pick up um, 
what they do is they, unless they're really close to Rochdale, they will take the rubbish to a transfer station where they dump it out and then it's loaded on bigger semi-trailers that then take it to Rochdale and then basically tip it out. And then it's uh, on the ground and it gets covered over at Rochdale. So a landfill like Rochdale uh, has an approval under the planning framework and linked into that is um, the assessment under the Environmental Protection Act. So if you wanted to apply for a big uh, landfill like um, Rochdale, you have to apply under the Planning Act and that triggers a state level assessment. So in Schedule 10 of the planning regulations, there is um, a trigger at a state level for uh, any material change of use of premises for an environmentally relevant activity is accessible development. So if you applied for a landfill, um, the ERAs, there's 64 prescribed ERAs that are listed in Schedule 2 of the Environmental Protection Regulation. So ERA 60 is waste disposal. So waste disposal consists of only one of the following. A, operating a facility for disposing of uh, only regulated waste, um, regulated waste or any co combination of the following general waste, limited regulated waste. So in um, waste management, general waste is like, you know, you, you've got your, your lunch, you know, the sort of things that you throw in a normal rubbish bin. Regulated waste tends to be hazardous in some way. So things like um, waste from a hospital that might be infectious would be regulated waste or things containing asbestos or things containing high levels of contaminants from an industrial process. That, those things are called regulated wastes. General waste, yeah, is the, the things that you tend to throw into your normal rubbish bin from a household. So if you're operating a facility to receive, say, general waste and you get over certain thresholds, um, so basically in, like if you're a farmer, and you're out in the you know rural area. Um, generally, farms have the ability to dispose of waste on site, but most um, mostly people have to put their waste in a rubbish bin, and it goes to a landfill somewhere. So in Brisbane, um, it goes to Rochdale, and it's ERA 60, and there is a, a approval for Rochdale landfill. Um, this is just some of the conditions from it. I'll put up the Roachdale landfill um, approval uh, if you wanted to look at the conditions. But it has, has a whole heap of conditions for things like a con collection system for landfill gas must be installed and maintained to efficiently minimise, um, yeah, basically emissions of um, landfill gas, so methane, those sorts of things. So they've got a system. Um, at Rochdale that takes out methane and burns it on site so and reduces greenhouse gas emissions from it as well. So that's an example of an environmentally rele relevant activity and its approval under the Act. Because we've already dealt with the whole development assessment system and the mining system where we've looked at environmental authorities and development approvals, I don't want to, um, I don't need to spend any greater time on it than that. I just simply wanted to link back to those earlier lectures and say that if you're carrying out an environmentally relevant activity, um, then you need, uh, it, it's a material change of use, and um, you then basically have a trigger at a state level and, and you require a development permit for it. So the prescribed ERAs, there's 64 of them, they're listed in the Environmental Protection Regulations, that's where you find them. And then there's also the uh, mining and petroleum activities as well as our environmentally relevant activities and those you require an environmental authority for uh, as well. So the licensing system under the Act is an important component uh, and linked to the planning system and, and also linked to the mining and petroleum systems. I just want to mention a couple of other components of the Act. Uh, that you'll see in different contexts and important to be aware of. So contaminated land is also dealt with in the Act. So Chapter 7, um, don't need to deal with that in detail, but um, 
basically about 30 years ago, uh, there was a contaminated land legislation was passed in Queensland. It, it came after, in New South Wales uh, in particular, we started to have problems with um, contaminants being left on land that are difficult to spot. And um, there was, when we get to our last lecture and we're talking about negligence, I'll use a case study of uh, a big contaminated site uh, for a timber treatment plant that was um, developed in Armadale and in a city in New South Wales. And it became, it was developed as a um, residential development and it had previously been a timber treatment plant. The council allowed it to be developed and they were then um, not prosecuted. They were um, sued by a builder who had bought land and suffered a large financial loss. When, it be, when people became aware that the land was contaminated, he then couldn't sell, or the, the building company couldn't sell the land. And they sued the council for approving the site that council should have known was contaminated. So out of incidents like that, that was in the 1990s, um, the states developed um, registers where land that was affected by contaminants could be registered. And it's become a really important component of most regulatory systems. Because having your land listed on the contaminated land register is um, pretty, like it, it scares buyers off. So banks and the like don't like having their land um, listed on the contaminated land register. So in Queensland, we created a sort of lower level register called the Environmental Management Register. So there are two registers in Queensland under the Environmental Protection Act. There's the Environmental Management Register or EMR and the Contaminated Land Register or CLR. And the CLR has the higher level ones listed so it has sites that are known to be affected by hazardous contaminants and basically are dangerous. The Environmental Management Register um, gets a lot of sites that are there as much just for a flag to look out for them. So if they've had what are called notifiable activities, things that might have contaminated the site, um, the land is meant to be registered on the EMR and then if land comes to be developed, say land has previously had a factory on it and now someone wants to turn it into a childcare centre where kids are going to be running around, you know, potentially playing in the dirt. Those sorts of changes in use will typically um, trigger higher levels of assessment once it's recognised that the land is on the EMR. So if land is on the EMR for having previously had some industrial processes on it, and you don't really know how contaminated it is, then if you wanted to develop it as a residential estate or a childcare centre, then you typically have to go in and do more. You have to go in and do testing of the site for um, contaminants. Sorry, just getting a someone there speaking in, um, sounds like Mandarin. Do you, to just your, do you just want to put yourself on mute? Um, Great. Okay, so it's just talking about the um, EMR and CLR. So they're a part of the, so I don't know, 15 years ago, the what was the Contaminated Land Act was brought into the Environmental Protection Act and now sits as part of the Environmental Protection Act um, in sort of the back sections of the Act. So you've got the EMR and CLR. They're really common to have um, checks of the CLR and EMR whenever you put in a, a development application and it also when you buy and sell land most buyers will check the EMR and CLR just to make sure that it's not listed and if it is listed uh, that's basically a red flag to say look check this further. I, I'm going to do a search of the EMR and CLR for Samurai to give it to you for the group assignment so you'll actually see it. On this screen I've got uh, an example of a search response for land that basically is a couple of blocks of land um, and basically shows that um, on the land in the past there's been a notifiable activity that was carried out, um, as asphalt or bitumen manufacture 
explosive production and storage, petroleum product or oil storage. Those activities were carried out on the site and the land is listed on the EMR for that reason. So if you then did a search for lot 112 on plan SP 106901, say you were looking to buy the land, even though you go there and it all looks fine, um, the soil might be contaminated with residues of these past activities. The fact that it's on the EMR is basically a big red flag to check. So if you're buying it for a particular purposes, particular purpose, and then manage the site accordingly. It's not, so it's listed on the EMR, it's not listed on the CLR. Okay, so that's um, contaminated land, part of the Environmental Protection Act as well. A couple of other tools I just want to mention um, briefly before wrapping up. Um, one is Executive Officer Liability and the Due Diligence Defence. So I've given you a handout about due diligence as well. It's on the Blackboard site. So this is really common in environmental laws in the last 20 years. Um, so mostly companies carry out most business activities in countries like Australia and in the US and in Canada. So because the companies might carry out an activity and, and you know, cause damage and then, you know, if there's a problem, the company can just be wound up and they can go into receivership and the owners and the directors of that company might be pretty blasé about the, the harm that they cause because they think they can't be sued directly. So to focus the mind of directors, what legislatures around the world started doing was making directors of company liable for offences that are caused by a company's activities. And executive officers are liable unless they display due diligence. So that's why it's called the due diligence defence. And on the handout, you'll see that there's a whole range of um, uh, executive officer liabilities. I've given you section 493 of the um, Environmental Protection Act, which says executive officers of a corporation must ensure the corporation complies with the act. And if a corporation commits an offence against the act, each of the executive officers um, commit an offence. However, it's a defence if they prove either they weren't in a position to influence the company or they complied with the due diligence requirements. So, yeah, they took reasonable steps to ensure the corporation complies with the provision. So, in on the handout, you'll see the normal requirements for due diligence are that things like you establish a system for environmental management, that you establish reporting requirements, you ensure that your staff have appropriate training. Um, those are the sorts of things that executive officers have to do. And for big companies, it's a really you know big deal. Like BHP, you know you've got a, a you know major director. Um, it, it often you'll find like if you go out and you're working, say, an environmental manager, and you're working for a company, they could just be interested in, you know, the, the, the costs of compliance. But once you start saying to managers that, you know, do you know you're liable? You can be, you know, held liable for offences that the company commits. Then what I find when I do training for companies is executive officer liability is really important because managers go from thinking, oh, this is just going to cost us money, to, whoa, I can be liable for this personally. Well, I'm going to get the company to, to comply because I don't want to be um, charged and, you know, a big fine imposed on me for being negligent. Um, so it's executive officer liability is really important in practice. And it's typically a, a, an important reason why managers of companies put in place training systems, reporting systems. So due diligence, um, giving you a handout on a really important component of environmental protection laws generally. I just wanted to mention a final thing before wrapping up. Now I've gone over time, um, but chain of responsibility laws. So these are new provisions that are being put in place in the Act. And I just wanted to mention them because I think they're just so interesting. It's This is a, a new component of the Act that was created in 2016, and it just shows how environmental regulation continues to evolve and continues to... 
create new tools to deal with problems of you know, compliance and companies walking away. And so this was really created um, in 2016 in response to a number of um, companies that basically had set up, had, had big compliance problems where there was potential cleanups for their sites, where the conditions of their approvals and the financial assurances were going to prove inadequate. So one of the important ones was Clive Palmer and Queensland Nickel. So Clive Palmer owned at the time through his company, um, the Yubulu um, Nickel Refinery north of Townsville. You can see it in this image. It was a big nickel refinery and it had, here's the nickel refinery. It had these big tailings dams with a whole heap of pretty toxic stuff. It was right on the edge of the Great Barrier Reef. So um, these, um, yeah, it's a site in a very um, delicate area with a lot of contaminants. And if you shut that down and need to clean it up, it's very expensive to clean it up and manage it. So um, we've got a big problem in Australia with uh, abandoned sites. So this is a map showing there's about 50,000 ab abandoned mine sites across Australia. In Queensland, there's over 15,000 ab abandoned mine sites with a cost estimated at over a billion to rehabilitate. So in the past, we've had problems with abandoned sites. Now we try and deal with that through a range of provisions. So I mentioned in previous lectures, it's a sort of defense in depth. You have conditions that say you've got to rehabil rehabilitate your site. We link into that um, financial assurances. So you estimate the, the, the cost of rehabilitation and then you get that money set aside in a financial assurance so that if the company goes belly up, the government can draw upon the financial assurance. The problem with financial assurance is it can be inadequate, particularly for the sort of black swan events, the rare events where things go really badly wrong and no one thought that it would go this bad and suddenly you go from, you know, say $5 million cleanup to $500 million cleanup and the company goes into receivership with, you know, the money's already gone. So Link Energy, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. What happened was this was a massive company in the 90s. It had a value of over, um, yeah, hundreds of millions of dollars. It was expanding out into the US and it wanted to develop new technology called underground coal gasification. And so it had projects in the US and the like. Its assets um, in 20, yeah, 2010, around that, it had hundreds of millions of dollars was what it was valued at. But then it had this major contamination event where there were claims against it in the order of 325 million for um, yeah, cleanup of the site. So basically it had this site out at Chinchilla, which is uh, out past Toowoomba, um, about 300 kilometers west of Brisbane. Basically, if you focus in on Chinchilla, so up here is Chinchilla. So here's Chinchilla. And south of Chinchilla is the Link Energy underground coal gasification site. And here's the site, um, if I focus in on it. And this is it in its heyday, back in, I think, about 2010. So it doesn't look like much, but basically what they were doing, here's an image of it when it was operating back in, yeah, 2009. So basically the idea with this was um, you have a coal seam that's a few hundred meters underground and they put in air and then they ignite the coal seam and it turns it to gas and then you extract the gas. So it's different to um, coal seam gas, well, it's it's a different way of getting um, gas out of a coal seam from deep underground. So this technology was experimental. Um, they had an approval to do it under the Environmental Protection Act, and they were producing gas. 
and basically it just got away from them and they produced this massive contaminant plume. So this is a summary of the process. The process operated by Link Energy Underground Coal Gasification. Um, it's an aspect of fracking coal seams colloquially known yeah, as fracking. Fracturing of coal seams colloquially known as fracking. The term fracking also covers a number of other processes. The actual process involves setting fire to a coal seam underground and production of various gases that are used in particular processes. Ten particularly, sorry, particularly the generation of power uh, related to the link system conversion of the gas. So this is the decommission site. So where the, all those pipes were. So um, in 2015, basically, so there was the process got away um, and they contaminated this huge area. So here's Chinchilla up here. At one stage, there was this massive area where um, the Department of Environment had declared an excavation caution zone. It was There was concern that basically digging in the ground could basically ignite it or cause explosions. Um, so this huge contaminated area arose out of the Link Energy site and, and the local community was horrified. Um, and the Department of Environment, um, I've criticised them in the past, but in this case, they responded really well. There was a massive investigation of it and a number of prosecutions. The company went into receivership um, and, yeah, the um, regulator pursued them, got um, millions of dollars of fines. The company was in receivership, has also gone after the company directors. So out of this incident, because the financial assurance was was really inadequate for the harm that had been caused in the rehabilitation of the site, the chain of responsibility laws were created and they really reflect the speak softly but carry a big stick sort of adage. So I've mentioned in previous lectures, you can think of um, the Environmental Protection Act like a castle with multiple lines of defense. So your outer ring uh, can be things like conditions of approval and requirements for rehabilitation. Then within that, you've got your financial assurance. So if the company goes belly up, you've got a pot of money there that uh, you can draw upon for the government to rehabilitate it. And within that, you've got the chain of responsibility laws. So if the financial assurance proves inadequate, go after where the money went to. So people that got money from the project you can go after them to rehabilitate the site. So I won't go into the regulatory background of it, but this is just another important tool that's now being created in the Act. If you think of the Act like a big um, toolbox, this is an, an important additional tool. And again, I've used this image in a previous um, lecture, but if you're thinking of conditions of approval going across here, so condition for, conditions of approval can deal with honest and dishonest regulators as long as you've got sufficient assets or security um, as long as the company has got sufficient assets conditions of approval can deal with that problem similarly financial assurances as long as the company has sufficient assets financial assurances are okay and similarly orders against the company all of those things are fine until you get to the situation like link energy where there's not enough money left to deal with the rehabilitation. What do you do in that situation? Well, chain of responsibility laws allow you to follow the money and go after who got the money from the project. So um, the Environmental Protection Act allows now for orders to be made, environmental protection orders to be made against related persons. That has a really broad um, definition. It's broad because uh, Often dishonest people can be really creative in how they set up their, um, you know, their company structures and the like. So it's very broad. Uh, there's a guideline on how it's to be administered. Um, banks and other lenders are concerned about it, but the government's assured them that it's genuine arm's length investors are not going to be prosecuted, and neither will employees or contractors. The legislation targets those who stand to make large profits and those who are really standing behind the company and whose decisions have put the environment at risk. That's what it's targeted at. There have been relatively few chain of responsibility um, EPOs issued. So 
um, while they're relatively rare, they're still an important component if you think about ensuring that these sites are actually rehabilitated and there's not a perverse incentive for people to get in, get the profits and then leave and leave the mess behind for others to deal with. So Link Energy, there's been a whole series of prosecutions and there's still ongoing prosecutions of executive officers um, that are still ongoing in Queensland courts. But yeah, liquidators claims, um, claims against the CEO, Peter Bond, and a series of prosecutions. There was a $4.5 million fine um, made in 2018 against the company in liquidation. I don't need to deal with those, um, the detail of all of those cases. I just mention it. Uh, it's been a major development in the last five years in Queensland in terms of um, the regulatory system. So just to wrap up, um, this is, I know this is a long lecture, but this act is really important and the concepts that we've dealt with in the, act, in the lecture are important. The main thing I want you to take away is the general environmental duty and the concept of reasonable care. If you can take that away and have a feeling for how it operates in practice, then that's a big step forward. Uh, also be aware that the Environmental Protection Act is linked into other approval processes under the planning legislation as well as for mining and um, petroleum. And then there's um, other important mechanisms for contaminated land, executive officer liability um, are important. So I'll put up the Rochdale landfill uh, approval available on the Blackboard site. I've also got the Environmental Authority for um, that I put up in the last lecture as well for uh, one of the coal and gas operations. So if, um, to wrap up, the, the take-home points from this lecture are the Environmental Protection Act is an advanced piece of environmental protection legislation. It's a central component of Queensland's environmental regulatory system. Pollution is not a concept that is generally used in Queensland. Environmental harm is wider than pollution, so any adverse effect on environmental value, so land clearing, can cause environmental harm. Um, pollution is your, you know, is a widely used term, but I just make the point that environmental harm is wider than pollution. And also that the Act provides many tools for environmental planning and management, including links to the mining and petroleum regimes and the development assessment system under the Planning Act for environmentally relevant activities. So they're the take-in points. Okay, that's the lecture. Thanks, everyone.